Hello, welcome. I am so happy to be here today with two excellent political theorists and professors of political science who I also have the good fortune of calling my friends, Dr. Jennifer Forshee, who is an associate professor at Santa Fe College, and Dr. Dustin Fritkin, who is an assistant professor at Santa Fe College. And just because I, this is a totally irrelevant detail to what we're going to do today, but I think it's so cool that you guys are like this political theory power couple. They're married. How cool is that? Pretty cool. That's another reason to go to grad school. <laughs> That's true. I, I also met my wife. She did not, you know, grow up to become a political theorist, but I met her in, in graduate school as well. So yeah, it's where you know, great long lasting enduring relationships are formed. Uh, the best conversations. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> well, we are speaking of, you know, long lasting enduring relationships. We are here to talk about the political thought of Edmund Burke, um, who was a great admirer of long lasting enduring relationships of all sorts. Um, and I'm super excited to talk to you both in particular about Edmund Burke because you studied under one of the foremost Burke scholars, right? Um, as did I, Professor Dan O'Neill at the University of Florida. So we all um, have been drilled on our, on our Burke um, and we all teach him, is, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so you know, it, it's, it's actually harder than you might imagine to find um, political theorists who are kind of game to talk about um, Burke. Um, he doesn't make it onto enough syllabi, in, in my opinion, but he is definitely on Dr. Forshees and Dr. Fritkin. So um, it's a great honor to have you here today. So my first question, when did you first read Burke? And what do you remember about that experience? Um, I guess I'll, I'll go first, if you don't mind. Um, at the University of Kansas, when I was an undergrad, we all had to take a two semester series called Western Humanities. And uh, the second semester, uh, we started with the Enlightenment and I read Burke in that context and I read um, the reflections on the French Revolution. And I, I was infuriated. I wanted to throw the book. And I talked to my TA about it later and she was like, if you're not wanting to throw at least one book in a class like this, you're not really do doing the reason. So that was, I had a very visceral, um, just dislike of Burke, which you know has been weird because my, my attitude towards Burke has mellowed with age, which he would probably call a sign of my maturity, but then I'd have to, you know, stick my tongue out at him or something. <laughs> and how about you, Dr. Fritkin? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, my first encounter with Burke was in graduate school um, uh, in my second semester uh, in a class with Dan O'Neill uh, on uh, liberalism and its critics. And uh, yeah, so uh, the context in which I first encountered Burke was, was uh, uh, you know, his, uh, I, I guess, opposition to liberal thought. Um, as it came to exist in the context of the uh, late 18th century. So yeah, um, <laughs> uh, yes, that's. <laughs> all right, all right. So um, I first read Burke, um, there, was a, there was a course offered at, at um, my college on like the politics and history of the French Revolution or something like that. I, I did not take that course. Um, for whatever reason, you know, it didn't work in my schedule. It sounded hard. I don't know. Um, but all of my friends did. And they were reading, you know, all this really cool stuff that they just wanted to talk about all the time. And, you know, Rousseau and Burke and Mary Wollstonecraft and Todd Payne. And, and so I was like, I want to kind of know what's happening here. So, you know, over the summer or something, I got, I think probably the the cheap edition that the Liberty Fund puts out of the reflections. And I was like, let me just crack this over to read it. I'm a smart, educated person. I can read a book. And I had no idea what was happening. I didn't, I got very little out of it. Um, it did not position me to participate in those, you know, really thoughtful conversations that I wanted to be a part of. And 
I was like, and I'll never open that book again. And then I went to graduate school um, where, you know, I too took courses with, with Professor Dan O'Neill and TA'd for his intro class. And of course had to, had to get reacquainted with Burke um, pretty, pretty quickly. So, okay, cool. Um, so in this course, and I think probably when most people in a political theory context are teaching Burke, he's usually positioned, right, chronologically after, you know, folks like Thomas Hobbes, folks like John Locke, folks like Jean-Jacques Rousseau. That's certainly how my syllabus is organized. So I thought it might be helpful for my students to hear y'all's thoughts on the question of like, how do we understand Burke in relationship to these really influential political thinkers that came before him? What are some similarities, if there are any? What are the big differences? How do you think about that relationship? Justin, would you like to start? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I suppose um, uh, probably the most fundamental difference uh, between Burke and, and thinkers like Locke and Hobbes uh, uh, is uh, his insistence on the importance of the continuity of history and historical development, right? That, that uh, uh, you know, that, that insofar as you can discern rights and liberties, uh, you can discern them in the, the way that they have developed uh, through historical uh, uh, and cultural uh, uh, um, um, processes, right? Uh, which is to say he fundamentally rejects the idea uh, that we ought to begin our analysis of politics uh, through, you know, through a, a device like the notion of the state of nature, right? His point, I think, or part of his point, or, or, or certainly his, his, his starting point, uh, uh, is to say that the state of nature um, is an absurd idea and should be rejected. Um, uh, you know, so, so to, you know, to think that, that, that there was some sort of point of origin that existed prior to society uh, is, uh, is basically a non-starter for thinking about how, you know, politics should work, how rights and liberties should work, uh, how we should understand our relationship with one another, right? Uh, um, uh, <clears throat> And so <laughs> anyway, uh, right, that is a non-starter for Burke. Um, and uh, saying that, I guess I would uh, kick it over to, to Jen and see if uh, she would like to pick up on, okay. on some of this. Um, yeah, so I, I teach Burke on the heels of Rousseau. Um, I teach Locke. I have a personal aversion to Hobbes. I can't even teach him. <laughs> <laughs> I respect both of you for being able to do it. You drive me bonkers. Um, but uh, one of the most interesting things for me uh, is this issue of reason, you know, and I think Dustin touches on it here when he talks about the absurdity of the state of nature. But to look at two thinkers like Rousseau and Burke, who seem to stand for very opposite political goals, and see that in both of them, that emerges out of a critique of abstract reason. Right. Um, I believe Rousseau says that he rejects any state of nature that makes man a philosopher before it makes him a man. And I feel like, you know, he, that's something he and Burke could absolutely high five over. <laughs> um, you know, yeah, that's, that's a lot of people rolling around in their graves saying that. Um, but uh, that's an important thing that they share, even if, you know, uh, the the revolution proceeds, right, according to Burke, right, the French Revolution proceeds according to the use of abstract reason or the misuse of abstract reason. Uh, he, you know, you can see that in Rousseau, there was really a desire for something more, more essential, something more social, right, to be the root of a revolution in France. No, I, I think that's absolutely right. Um, one of the similarities that I see between Rousseau and Burke, who, right, are very different in many ways, and probably on many, many substantive issues would not have agreed. But I think they both, they both have this sense that, you know, to use a kind of contemporary cliche, politics is downstream from culture, that, um, that we have to cultivate a certain 
kind of sociable disposition before we can expect to cohere together um, in some sort of civil or political society, right? Um, I think they're both interested in, in that um, and share that, that concern and that commitment, which is very different from you know, Hobbes and Locke, who I think embrace this more kind of you know, abstract um, view and atomistic view, right? Where individuals are just sort of knocking around and even when they join together, they're never really together, right? Um, so yeah, no, I think that's right. I, I, another kind of similarity that, I, that interests me um, is between Hobbes and Burke. Um, I think that both, what I, what I take away, what I, what I put down Hobbes, what I, what I take away with is this sense that like the state of nature is abominable and must be escaped at any cost, right? And even though, you know, as we've talked about, Burke quarrels with this notion of a state of nature, I think that life outside of social, civic, political bonds for Burke is abominable. And we should do everything we can to avoid it at all costs, right? Um, it, you want to respond to that, Dustin? I saw you. Oh, no, I, I mean, I, th I think I... I... I just, I think you're right about that. And I think it's one of the reasons why both of them are, uh, both Hobbes and Burke are totally comfortable with absolutism. <laughs> yes, and very uncomfortable with even the meekest, <sighs> meagerest forms of resistance, right? Yeah, yes. <sighs> so yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in there because I think that's a mischaracterization of Burke. Um, you know, specifically when we look at when he, begins his parliamentary career, you know, around 1765, what we see is one of the first topics he sets his cap at is um, the control of those pro-monarchist, uh, right, the Tories who are sometimes called the friends of the king, who are really looking to shore up absolutism in, in England. And he rejects that outright, right? He is in favor of, of strong constitutional checks on, on the king. He just doesn't think that they come from nowhere, right? They don't come to us by God. They come down to us through the habituation of Englishmen holding their monarchs accountable, right? That manly liberty that he's such a friend of. Um, so I just, I think we can say that Hobbes is actually significantly more um, absolutist than, than Burke. Is. And I think, I think that's a totally right and fair point. And I, <laughs> I, I stand corrected. <laughs> Um, you know, one of the things that I find really fascinating about reading Locke and Burke together is that I'm, I'm not an Ashcraftian, and I know for students won't necessarily know what that means, but I have a very particular reading of Locke in his context, and Locke is defending, um, Locke is defending the idea of a government, albeit a monarch, that is responsive to the will of its people through some mechanism of representation. And Locke never brings up who's being represented or how they're being represented. And I think that there's good reason for us to believe that what he's trying to do is to defend the particular form of parliamentarism in England prior to the rise of James II. And so in that way, right, the bastion of the liberal tradition and Burke Right at the end of the day, they're both Whigs and their approach to politics on the ground is very, very similar, even if one believes it comes from divine reason and the other through um, the flow of history. Right? Um, I think they're shockingly close together on the type of politics they advocate. Go ahead. Yeah, agreed. Uh, yeah, agreed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you know, this, this was not a question that was on my list, but I think it might be a question that's helpful to ask, especially in light of this important uh, point that Dr. Forshe is trying to get us to acknowledge, right? That this idea that like Locke and, and Burke, it's easy to set up this kind of um, dichotomous, you know, highly stylized contrast between them. But at the end of the day, they, they share some things in common. So maybe you could talk to us a little bit about Burke's response to another revolution um, not the French Revolution, which is what they're reading about, but his response to the American Revolution, which you know happened just a, just a few short years before the French. 
So you're our Americanist, uh, Dustin, would you like to uh, take this? Well, you know, I, I, uh, um, <clears throat> Uh, I'm not particularly an expert on Burke's reaction to the American Revolution, but but uh, uh, but broadly speaking, he was for it, or at least he was in favor of the uh, the point that the American colonists were making about asserting their rights as English subjects, um, and uh, uh, you know, and 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 you know, he saw what they were doing in the context of the Glorious Revolution of 1688. Um, uh, and, and was, you know, as such, I guess, broadly approving of what they were trying to do. I, he wasn't so much in favor of American independence as he was in favor of the point that the American colonists uh, were making about their mistreatment by the parliament and the king. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah I, I think he wishes the French revolutionaries or those actors who became the French revolutionaries would have, you know, adopted some sort of process of conciliation and, you know, um, along the lines of what he saw the, the American revolutionaries early on attempting to do, maybe. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree completely. Like, I think, you know, Burke laid the fault of the American revolution squarely at the foot of the king, right? Had he understood their rights as Englishmen, right? Evolutionary rights as Englishmen, this whole debacle could have been afforded. There's actually this really great quote from um, his work on American taxation. I'm sorry, I'm gonna read, I'm not very good at memorizing quotes, but uh, he, he writes that if sovereignty and their freedom cannot be reconciled, which will they take? They will cast your sovereignty in your face. <laughs> uh, no body of men will be argued into slavery, right? Um, and it's so wild to hear something so vehement, right? Sovereign, your sovereignty, the king's sovereignty, or my freedom. Like, what am I going to pick? I mean, obviously. But to hear this man who rails so vehemently against the liberty backed by the French, it's it's kind of a shocking thing to see. Um, it's, uh, I don't know, I think it's probably something we're going to have to get into. But, you know, sometimes... Sometimes Burke's reading of his own English history and his own commitments is a trifle dishonest, or maybe lacks self-reflexivity. I don't know. Well, we can leave that. Or, or just isn't even that concerned with like historical facts, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> at least he's transparent, right? I mean, I don't have it in front of me, but you know, there's there's a passage somewhere in the middle um, of the reflections where he kind of talks about the uses and abuses of history. And he's like, look, if we want to recount a kind of accurate version of history, then what we're going to be led into is just an unending, you know, kind of back and forth of recrimination and violence. And you did this to me. So in revenge for that, I'm going to. So he's like, let's just not concern ourselves with what actually happened in the past. And let's tell a kind of just so story that will be conducive to sociability and civic harmony and you know, peace and continuity, right? <laughs> a mythopoetic, right? Uh, origin story, yeah. Yes. We all need, and it's, it's 1688. <laughs> Which frankly is another, there's, there's another parallel between, you know, Burke and Rousseau, because I think Rousseau kind of thinks about the, the, the use of myth and history in, the, in this way too. Oh, all right. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> That's a whole no, other. <laughs> we could go on and on. Um, this is, this is the downfall of this kind of pedagogical approach that I've embraced is that I get together with my nerd friends and we talk about the nerd things that we love and they can go on and on and on and on. Um, we call that dinner at home. So <laughs> I'm so jealous. I'm so jealous. All right. So this is probably my favorite question to ask about every thinker that I talk to people about. What's your favorite passage from the reflections and why do you like it so much? Oh, this this devolved into a very long conversation that involved attacking books with uh, with sticky notes last night at our house, and I feel a little bit bad because I absconded with the sticky noted Burke. I'm sorry about that, Dee. That's uh, okay. I've got the uh, I, I've got the uh, uh, um, the online library of Liberty version up on my computer right now. So uh, I brought the home version of Burke to my office and realized I had two other versions of Burke here. So <laughs> I have three copies of the reflections to hand here. Um, so we actually, uh, you know, we almost came to blows last night over which one of us was going to read which of these quotes. 
um, because it turns out we have similar favorites. Um, so I'll go ahead and find mine in here, just a second. So um, the semester that Dustin took uh, liberalism and its critics with Dan O'Neill, I was actually working on a paper on Burke and Dan and I uh, participated in, oh, I believe it was the Western Political Science Association Conference. And I actually drew the title of my paper on Burke from this particular section because we're gonna talk about decent drapery and, uh, and that's my favorite part. So um, it's, it comes on the heels of a really extraordinary description of how beautiful Marie Antoinette is, but um, now we're gonna talk about how the revolution is ruining it. Um, but now all is to be changed. All the pleasing illusions which made power gentle and obedience liberal, which harmonized the different shades of life, and which by a bland assimilation incorporated into politics the sentiment which beautify and soften private society, are to be dissolved by this new conquering empire of light and reason. All of the decent drapery of life is to be rudely torn off. All of the superadded ideas furnished from the wardrobe of a moral imagination which the heart owns and the understanding ratifies as necessary to cover the defects of our naked shivering nature and to raise it to dignity in our own estimation are to be exploded as ridiculous, absurd, and antiquated fashion. <sighs> yeah. I can just read Burke out loud like all day. It's so good. He's such an extraordinary writer. Why do you, why do you love that passage? I, it's self-evident to Dustin and I, but... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so it really touches back on uh, on your assertion, Lorna, that for Burke, anything approaching the state of nature, anything outside of civilization is brutal, is itself some sort of savagery, right? In the absence of the chivalry, the codes, the morals, the pilot, politesse, we're animals, right? Um, naked and shivering. And what I love about it is that's my favorite thing about the French Revolution, right? My favorite thing about the French Revolution is the ripping asunder of all of these super added costumeries, right? That are essentially obscuring what we really need from one another. Um, and I think it just, it so beautifully touches on what he thinks is being destroyed. And I feel it, I sense it, it's beautifully portrayed. And also like, I just, this, pump when I read it. Um, it's extraordinary. <laughs> excellent. Excellent choice. <laughs> All right, Professor Fritkin. Oh, well, you know, bef before moving on to uh, uh, to my favorite, um, you know, I want to uh, connect uh, that, that aspect of Burke uh, to something else, which is uh, you know, in the Communist Manifesto, right, Marx says, uh, all that is solid melts into air, all that is holy is profaned, and man is at last compelled to face with sober senses his real conditions of life and his relations with his kind. Uh, which is to say that, that you know, um, Marx and Burke have a similar diagnosis of what happens uh, uh, in the context of liberal capitalism. Right, it's just that they have a different interpretation of what the valence of that is, right? Well, uh, and I, I think Burke thinks the solution is to go back to what came before commercial society, right? Sure. right. Um, yeah. Whereas Marx yeah. thinks the solution is back to, on. <laughs> to, to move beyond it, right? Yeah, exactly, right, yes. Resolidify all of those things that have, that have, that have turned to air, right? Like, yes. Uh, <laughs> well, and I don't think there's any coincidence that, you know, one of Carlyle's first first piece is Sartre Rosartis, right? Retailoring the tailor, like Absolutely. a metaphor, Retailer. sorry, just to call attention to what's behind me here, but, you know, just draw attention to this <laughs> metaphor of the clothing of civilization. It's, it's quite prevalent. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, yes. And important, right? Like, uh, um, um, the, uh, uh, the, um, how, how how would I like to say this? Um, Burke in the at the end of the uh, uh, of the end of the century at the end of the 18th century sort of sets the stage for an important conversation in the 19th century about you know the importance or lack thereof uh, of the veils uh, of the you know of, of the artifices uh, that make uh, civilization possible or or uh, or do the opposite right or uh, in, the veils that impede the development of an actual civilization worthy of the name. Yeah. Okay. 
so uh, so uh, so my my favorite quote. Um, so I have I have a short version and a long version, um, and I will begin with the short version. Um, the <laughs> short version of my favorite Burke quote. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, my 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 favorite short version of of Burke is. Uh, Believe me, sir, those who attempt to level never equalize. In, in all societies consisting of various descriptions of citizens, some description must be uppermost. Right, so this is a, a Burke weighing in against the idea of equality, right? Um, and to uh, kind of uh, clarify what he means by that, um, <clears throat> I would uh, uh, ex expand it by going down a paragraph um, uh, to where he says uh, that, and I quote, <clears throat> uh, the occupation of a hairdresser or of a working tallow chandler cannot be a manner of honor to any person to say nothing of, of more servile employments. Such descriptions of men ought not suffer oppres oppression from the state uh, but the state suffers oppression if such as they, either individually or collectively, are permitted to rule. In this you think you are combating prejudice, but you are at war with nature. Yeah, and just to, for the students, right, this is in the context of his critique of the newly created French National Assembly, right? right? Um, and he's talking about, look, it's all lawyers and stock jobbers and doctors and, you know, whatever well, those weird course. occupations you just said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, butchers and bakers and things like that, you know, I mean, you know, people who earn a living from getting their hands dirty. And you certainly do not want people like that to be in charge of the state, according to Burke, right? I mean, like, like, this is the disaster of democracy. And then he then he goes on to say, like, not only should these folks not be allowed to rule, but even if they have spectacular talents and can move up, the system really shouldn't be designed to facilitate their mobility, which is hilarious. It, it, it should allow for them. To, there, there, there should be some element of meritocratic possibility, but it should be arduous, right? Yes. I think he says, oh, I forget it, but it's like the the trophy of esteem has to be set upon a pinnacle or yeah, I'm, I'm butchering it, but yeah, you got to like put it on a very yeah. steep hill. Like he yeah. was to be, to be sort of plucked out of obscurity and, 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 you know, given patronage ah. by a peer, right? <laughs> you yeah. got to get that pocket appointment to parliament, man. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, Burke, not an egalitarian, right? Um, no, certainly not. Yes. And an elitist. Um, I think that that comes through. All right, so for my for my passage, um, I picked his description of the events, you know, the October days, the <laughs> women's march on Versailles. Um, you know, which to him is just it is it's like his worst nightmare come to life. Um, right, you've got these market women, poor poor working class women who are outraged over the, the price of bread mm -hmm. and who are hungry. And they decide, ladies, let's do something about this. So they go to the local armory, they get some weapons, they get a cannon, and they march to the king's palace to demand redress, right? And then of course, you know, the, the kind of most horrifying part of it all is that like, the king comes out and, you know, puts on the, you know, revolutionary cockade and sort of pan panders to them and, and acquiesces to some of their <laughs> demands. And then the next day they lead the king and the queen back to Paris, right? Um, so anyway, you know, Burke's, Burke's description of, of these events, it's, you just don't, you will not find better prose in the English language right, than on page 71, kids. So you can't see your book. Um, <laughs> Right, so he says, history will record that on the morning of the 6th of October, 1789, the king and queen of France, after a day of confusion, alarm, dismay, and slaughter, lay down under the pledge security of public faith to indulge nature in a few hours of respite and troubled, melancholy repose. 
From the sleep, the queen was first startled by the voice of the sentinel at her door, who cried out to her to save herself by flight, that this was the last proof of fidelity he could give, that they were upon him and he was dead. Instantly he was cut down, a band of cruel ruffians and assassins reeking with his blood, rushed into the chamber of the queen and pierced with a hundred strokes of bayonets and poignards the bed from whence this persecuted woman had just time to fly almost naked, right? So, I mean, I just, I, I could go on and on. I could, oh, yeah. I could um, <laughs> but I, I, what I love about this passage apart from, I mean, it's just thrilling, right? Um, it's, it's cinematic, right? Um, you are, in the moment, um, in in a in a way that's kind of unmatched, certainly in anything we're going to read in the course, kids, right? <laughs> um, but you know, I think it also it's 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 just brilliant because it so effectively serves Burke's, I think, kind of overarching aim in the the reflections, which is to draw this contrast between English government and politics and culture and French government politics and culture in this age of revolution, right? Because whenever he's talking about the kind of English, you know, political culture or whatever, he's, he's talking about, you know, how our, our institutions, our political institutions kind of function on the same principle of familial inheritance, right? Um, as our private families, and you have this nice harmony between the way we sort of naturally live our lives as members of families and the way we are um, integrated into this political community as as citizens. So you have this like beautiful harmony between these kind of traditional patriarchal family norms and the British constitution. But then you look across the English channel at what's happening in revolutionary France. And I mean, here you have the revolution as an, an attempted rape, right? Um, all of those you know, kind of patriarchal familial norms are being flouted and defied. Um, and the kind of sexual perversion that Burke sees embodied in that March on Versailles, he, he sees as kind of being acted out in the political sphere in the context of the revolution. So I think it's just, it just so brilliantly serves that overarching aim to draw that contrast um, and associate, you know, all that's British with all that's chaste and all that's chivalrous and all that's traditional and patriarchal and then all that's French with all that's lascivious and out of order and perverse and yeah and, whoa it's great stuff will will your students be reading Wollstonecraft next they will of yes. course so just to allude to to whet your appetite ladies and gentlemen as you approach <laughs> Wollstonecraft, um, one of the most extraordinary bits of the beginning of her Vindication of the Rights of Man is her pointing out just how beautiful and elegant Burke's prose is, and yet how incapable he is of taking that same sympathetic position that he applies to the king and queen and applying it all to the lives of those market women, right, who somehow by virtue of their labor are de-sexed and um, treated as, as less than women. Um, in, in his narrative retelling, but uh, yeah, you can't, you can't beat the language. Um, all of the excesses of Carlyle's history of the French Revolution are essentially owed to that passage. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, yeah, amen. And, you know, to, to sort of piggyback on that, um, uh, you know, uh, I, I believe that the passage, Lorna, that you just read is the one that inspired Thomas Paine uh, to say that, that Burke uh, laments the plumage but forgets the dying bird, right? Um, right, which is, you know, that, that he limits the, 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 the end of, uh, uh, of, of the beauty of aristocracy, but, but forgets the, you know, forgets, forgets all the, you know, the, the horrors that lay underneath it, you know? Um, yeah, this is, I mean, time and time again, I mean, we could point to literally dozens of instances, right, where he's, he's he, oh, the poor clergy, right, <laughs> s stripped of their you know, kind of noble prerogatives, and oh, the poor nobility, how unfairly they're being dealt with by this, just these brutes of the National Assembly. I mean, his kind of well of sympathy for the powerful and the privileged is bottomless. Mm -hmm. um, and yet when he, you know, like in that passage Dustin shows, right, when he speaks of people who do not partake um, of those titles or do not have those privileges and prerogatives, um, it's, it's scorn and disdain and disgust. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly, right? Yeah, if you didn't start beautiful, 
uh, then you are, you know, basically nothing to, to Burke. All right, last question, because we do have to wrap this up because there's no way, I mean, there's no way my <laughs> students are watching this. We, you can basically say whatever you want at this point because they have not made it this far. <laughs> Faith right. in you kids. So, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I sent you a version of this last question, but I'm gonna ask it in an even more open-ended way because I think that'll elicit more interesting responses. What do you think is the, the relevance of Burke today? Why read Burke? today, why bother? Is he of any more than purely kind of antiquarian interest or maybe literary interest if we, as we've talked about his, his great you know, abilities as a writer? Why read Burke today? Dustin, you want to go first? Oh God. Um, yeah. So, so um, <laughs> it's a hard question to answer, I think, actually. Um, uh, certainly Burke is an important uh, an important contributor to the development of what we now call uh, modern conservatism, um, but his relevance, uh, his relevance actually, you know, right now uh, in our 21st century moment is is actually unclear um, to me. I think uh, uh, you know um, one of my favorite Burke quotes uh, that we didn't get to yet uh, is. Um, uh, is his recognition co comes from his recognition that that there are actually you know we can recognize that there are problems with our society problems with our government government right um, uh, and he says about it uh, the roughly the following uh, we ought to approach the wound uh, the defects of the state as we would the wounds of the father right with pious awe and trembling solicitude right. <laughs> Which, which to me, I think captures the essence of what we would mean by traditional conservatism, right? The idea that, that you know, uh, we need to be cautious about the way we, uh, the ways we attempt to reform the state, reform society, change. You know, we ought to be careful about the way we try to change things, um, because you know, in our attempts to make things better, we might actually make things worse, and we should worry about that because we don't, you know. Uh, as we attend to the wounds of the father, we don't want to kill him, right? <laughs> um, uh, uh, which is um, not actually reflected in, in current, what goes by the name of conservatism nowadays. So uh, yeah, anyway. right, right. Like lock, lock her up, and you know, the, this yeah, whatever exactly. you hear chanted at, at Trump rallies, I think Brooke would be absolutely horrified and appalled by. Right. That, yeah, yeah. So the, the Trump administration did not approach to the wounds of the US Constitution <laughs> with pious awe and yeah, trembling exactly. solicitude. Right? Yeah, exactly right. Neither awe nor solicitude. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, you know, I mean, honestly, I think that, that Burke is worth reading uh, uh, in no small part as to be used as a cudgel, uh, you know, to say like, uh, uh, to say to people that what you are doing, what you are calling conservatism now is not in fact conservative and deserves some other name like for example, reactionary. Yeah, um, I perhaps it's indicative of how much time we spend together. We have been married for 10 years now, but um, that is definitely uh, a concern of mine, although uh, less as a cudgel, but more as a, as a humanizing figure, uh, because so many of our students do have this idea that, you know, you might have to preface conservative with compassionate just to make it clear. Um, I don't think that that would have been necessary when you look at the way Burke's writings and career unfold, right? He is sympathetic to the tax burden of the United States. Um, when he became a member of the, the Committee of Inquiry on India, he was appalled by what he saw as the mistreatment of, of Native uh, Indians in the East India Company and conducted you know, a seven-year campaign to right the wrongs of Warren Hastings. And also um, something that I think is often overlooked in his work was that he was an abolitionist. Um, you know, shortly after the Zong massacre where uh, a slave ship taking slaves to Jamaica just massacred its own slaves because they thought that they would make more money on the insurance claim than on their persons. Uh, he wrote his revision of the Negro Code and then eventually published it in 1792. And it advocated for a slow, I mean, he is conservative, but an abolition of, 
of the slave trade and massive regulations on the slave trade in the interim um, that really show a deep understanding and compassion for, for humans regardless of their color. Right, and um, I think that that's often often overlooked when we when we talk about conservative ideology today, and that's there. That's it's in its very birth, and we can talk about inequality, and we can talk about its dehumanization of the lower classes, but um, and that that is important. It's not something we should set aside entirely, but we also need to look at uh, the the real respect for human relations um, that that Burke had. I think it's meaningful. Yeah, I think of um, these passages where you, part, part of his beef with the French revolutionaries is he thinks they're they're like two in their heads, right? Um, um, and you know he's like, we English, right? We have hearts that beat in our chest, and you know, like we're capable of kind of normal human sympathy, and you know, like you philosophers are sort of alienated from the kind of humanity that you you've become you know, sort of despots and, and calloused um, in some sense. So yeah, I think there are those, those elements in Burke that we can maybe pump up the volume on and amplify to complicate certain aspects of what passes as conservative discourse in 21st century America, for sure. There's no doubt. All right, well, my dog has wanted me to stop having this conversation from the minute that we started. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe Micanopi loves Edmund Burke and has a lot to contribute, but unfortunately, I don't speak Schnauzer. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to wrap it up, but I do want to thank you all from the bottom of my heart for taking the time to do this. It has been an absolute delight, and I look forward to the next time we can, you know, sort of commune and geek out together. Absolutely. This was great. Thank you, Lorna. Yeah, thanks, Lorna. It's been great talking with you. <laughs>